I'm John Kovach. I'm a newspaper editor. I'm a radio announcer. I'm a high school football coach. And since I was old enough to stand on the side of a stream next to my dad, I've been an angler. I've fished with bait, lures, and flies. I've fished with spinning gear, fly rods, jigging poles, and tip-ups. I've stood on ice, waded rapids, and been tossed about the deck of a boat. And I want you to love fishing, be it freshwater or salt, heavy flows, high seas, or cutting through a foot of ice, as much as I do, no matter what the quarry, no matter the tactics, no matter the chosen tackle. Welcome to Yankee Fisherman. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Yankee Fisherman, presented by the Dock Shop. It's December. I can't believe it. But it's here. The holidays are coming up. Great time of year. Exciting time of year. Special time of year. Really looking forward to it. There's a holiday event this weekend, and that's up in Manchester, Vermont, at the American Museum of Fly Fishing, where they will have hooked on the holidays on Saturday, December 3rd, 1 to 4 p.m. Kids can learn how to... Uh, the skills necessary to, t to tie a fly. There's cookie decorating, free admission. Uh, this is done in partnership with Southern Vermont Trout Unlimited. But it's also a great chance to meet the new executive director. 2016 has been busy in that the two major fly fishing museums in the Northeast both got new executive directors. Bob Rooley is the new leader up at the American Museum in Vermont. We had a chance to talk to him earlier this week. John Kovach, Yankee Fisherman. We are joined by phone by Bob Rooley. Bob has just joined the American Museum of Fly Fishing in Manchester, Vermont as their new executive director. Bob, welcome aboard. It's, it's good to see another angler get that job overseeing the history of fly fishing in America. Thanks very much. I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, excited to be starting a new part of my career, and I'm really looking forward to the next few years here. Now, you're coming from Nantucket, where you ran uh, nonprofits and for-profit organizations. Uh, most recently, the Nantucket Conservation Foundation, where you worked in development. Tell us about that job. Sure. Uh, Nantucket Conservation Foundation is the largest landowner on Nantucket. About one-third of the island is under their ownership. It's essentially a private land trust that makes open space available to the public. Uh, it's a 50-year-old organization and by far the largest landowner on the island. And it's really kind of, if you ask me, the single largest contributor to the high quality of living on Nantucket. And you were also involved in the Cranberry Festival. That draws more than 7,000 people each year. That had to be some undertaking. Yeah, the, uh, one, of, one of the many holdings of, of, of NCF is the milestone and windswept cranberry bogs. Uh, annually, we, over Columbus Day weekend, we always held one of the great island events on Columbus Day weekend. We invite everyone out to watch us harvest the berries and put up a few tents, hire a band, make some barbecue, and it's over the last 11 years that I was involved really become an extremely loved community event and it kind of over time we realized that this was the first time a lot of people had had a time from the busy summer season to kick back look up and say hello to their neighbors again and it really became a great getting to know you fun open space event and it's in one of the most beautiful places on the island and people get to watch this the the, the harvest of these berries, which historically has, hasn't changed much in the last 30 or 40 years. Now, how is the fishing in and off Nantucket? Uh, it's pretty spectacular. We're, uh, I come from a long line of saltwater fishermen. I'm a, you know, a bluefish, bluefish, striped bass, false albacore, bonita, tuna. Those are all available. Um, there are actually a number of IGFA freshwater records are held on Nantucket for things like white perch and chain pickerel as well. There's a a fairly uh, robust freshwater fishing community in the off season, but really, you know, our bread and butter are striped bass and bluefish and bluefin tuna. And you yourself are an angler, primarily saltwater. Absolutely, yeah. I, I um, I've been. I, my dad was a ran private yachts when he was a younger guy. I've been angling my entire life. I'm, I'm always happiest with a hook in the water. 
Um, with that said, I, I've been a trout fisherman for about 20 years, and there's not a trout to be found on Nantucket, but I, I love traveling all through New England. I love the Rangeley Lakes and Coash County up in New Hampshire are all areas where I love to go up and go fly fishing. Now, did you do any saltwater fly fishing off Nantucket? Absolutely, sure. I'm a, I, I'm, I've probably done as much fly fishing in the last 10 years as I've done regular fishing. We're, uh, we're always thrashing the water, especially the stripers in the early spring when they come up and the water's crystal clear. And then in September and October when the albies are busting, there's no, probably no better fly rod fish for my money. Uh, we have, we have, we have a, a pretty impressive fishery there, and it's, it's, it's a great place for a guy with any kind of tackle. Do you get your albie run a little bit more regularly than we do here along the Sound? Uh, I, don't, I don't ever equate albies in the word regular. <laughs> um, they, they came in early. There were a lot of them this year, and they stayed late. Um, they're, you know, it's funny. They, they seem to be coming earlier and staying later every year. Um, it was a pretty darn good run the last two years. So, I mean, they're pretty much, you know, you can count on the first Bonita showing up last week of July and the first Albie showing up third week of, of August, usually something like that. Um, and the Albies, I, I know a guy who got one in November, so they're, they're around. Very cool. So where do you see the, the direction of the American Museum of Fly Fishing going? Well, it's, it's a couple of things, really. I, 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 I see the future of this museum and what I would, the impact I would like to have on it is two things. I would like to make, I'd like to give us a bigger footprint here in Manchester, which is, this is not unlike Nantucket. It's a beautiful resort town with a lot of second homeowners. Um, natural beauty is just second to none. There's a lot of reasons to come up here beyond skiing, beyond leaf peeping, beyond the horses, beyond the hiking. It's just, it's an incredibly beautiful place. And I'm trying to make the museum to be a bigger part of the overall Manchester experience. Excuse me. Um, beyond that, we are a small museum in a small town in a small state. So I'm, I'm really trying to take the museum out of Manchester. Over the last couple of years, we've had what we call here our uh, digital initiative, which essentially is is we are... You know, five years ago, we had a website that, that really no one would ever go to. Now we're really starting to, trying to be a lot more dynamic in our online sense. We've hired somebody on our staff who, and via things like social media, via simply using email and having a good web presence and talking with people outside of New England, we're really trying to bring the museum out. We've partnered with a number of other organizations. We have a very vibrant group called our Anglers Circle, which is people 40 and under who are bringing, um, we're bringing a real film initiative out. We've worked with the Fly Fishing Film Tour out in Cleveland and in New York, and we're really reaching outside of the museum. We, in the last few years, we've started having a presence in the trade shows and, and events like that. So I hope that we will continue to do that as well as sort of reach out through every available venue to the angling community. There's a, there's a big group of guys who are 25 to 45 years old who I would very much like to see coming to Manchester, seeing what we have. We have a great collection of tackle, and the photographs, the books here are really, really extraordinary. I'd love, I'd love to see them engaging with us not only electronically but also in person. I think there's something to be said with – spending time with the history of the sport to be able to see ties that were fly that were tied uh, 200 years ago to be able to see some of these rods that were used in famous catches and i think it just would help grow the sport i i, I couldn't agree more and and especially to see you know those guys who were who were doing it first they always intrigue me to see, you know, to see the rods and reels that they used and the line, and even just the knots and the hooks and everything was different. Uh, some of it's really pretty extraordinary. Um, and especially, we just, got, we just got a donation just the other day of, of some salmon flies from Russia tied, by, tied during the Cold War by Russian fly tires. And they didn't have access to our books or our patterns, so they just made their own. And they're really... It's cool to see them. They don't look like every other salmon fly. They're just, these guys had seen some flies but had never taken them apart and didn't have the same material, so they made do with what they had. And they, 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 we just got a dozen of these 
great double hooked salmon flies are beautiful and we'll have them here on display for people to come take a look at and it really is an interesting look at you know pre-internet pre and during the cold war what people did on the other side of the world uh, that's fascinating i look forward to getting up there to see that what are some of your favorite exhibits currently on display there's some great stuff here um i'll tell you it's 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 uh I, I was just walking through the museum with somebody. I'll tell you my favorite thing in the museum is a Fluger medalist reel, which we've all had at least one of. Um, it came from Lefty Cray, and if you've ever read his fabulous book, it's called Advanced Fly Fishing Techniques. It's not one of his most famous, but it's my favorite book. He sh he has this great like you know pro tip how to make how to how to put pressure on a, a Fluger medalist reel by cutting the backing out, and you can push your fingers into the spool from the back. And we actually have the reel that's in the book that he has, you know, really kind of MacGyvered up so he could, it was before they had any kind of rim control available on them. This is probably back in the 50s. And so we have this reel that Lefty kind of, you know, got his hacksaw out on and sanded down the edges and was meticulous. He did a fabulous job, as you would expect from him. And it's just this really great MacGyvered reel. It's right next to a couple of Seamasters and a whole bunch of Vom Hofs, but this $30 Fluger medalist is just a great thing to look at. So it sounds like you've got some stuff up there be between the, the flies from behind the Iron Curtain and the, uh -huh. and the reel modified by uh, Lefty, some people kind of making do. And I think you've really got the makings of an exhibit there as to how people make do to become fly anglers. That's a great idea. I hadn't thought of that, but it, you know, it never even occurred to me that, that those two things that have jumped out at me, and I don't know the collection as well as I probably should yet. I'm still a few weeks into this. But uh, I'd, I'd take a moment to let you know that we also have an extraordinary collection of, of some of the greatest. We have bamboo rods by every maker you've ever heard of. We've got a tremendous selection of Bogdan fly reels. We have, uh, we have some of the oldest. In fact, I think we have the oldest known flies ever tied. Um, the leaders are actually made of grass. They're so old. Um, we have a, a really impressive collection of sporting art. And our, I think our angling library is among the best in the world. You've got a great collection up there, and I really look forward to seeing what you do with it and helping you spread the word about the American Museum of Fly Fishing. Bob Rooley, the new executive director of the AMF up, F up in Manchester, Vermont. Thanks for joining us on Yankee Fisherman. You bet. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time. Thank you. Okay. We'll be back with more Yankee Fishermen presented by the Dock Shop right after this. The holidays are a wonderful time to spend with families and friends, sharing a fantastic meal. Football season is in full swing. The fishing has been unbelievable, and it's time to make a list and check it twice. Stop at the Dock Shop, get a fix of summer, and browse loads of new products, including fishing tackle, accessories, clothing, jewelry, and home decor. Boater beach bum, fishermen, or simply love the New England coast, this is a unique place to shop. The Dock Shop, 51 Tokenique Road, Darien, 609 Riverside Avenue, Westport, or dockshop.com. On time, done right, safe and reliable, Mr. Handyman CT. Let our satisfied customers tell it. I have called Mr. Handyman for every reason, every occasion, every broken item, every leak. They have bailed me out on many occasions, and I would recommend them to anyone. For any project, large or small. Mr. Handyman CD. Are you ready for winter? Ski and Sport has everything you need to be fully outfitted for the season. A family owned and operated business with over 40 years of experience, Ski and Sport's three convenient locations in Fairfield County offer top quality, high fashion ski and winter wear. In addition to clothing for men, women, and children, we also offer seasonal rentals for the entire family. Stop by our stores on 1 Ethan Allen Highway in Richfield, 877 Post Road East in Westport, and at 110 Main Street in New Canaan, or visit us at skiandsport.net. 
Why cook at all this holiday? Avoid the stress of holiday planning and let your friends at Walter Stewart's in New Canaan do the heavy lifting. Whether you're looking to fill in with a few crowd-pleasing sides or you want us to prepare your whole feast, from cranberry sauce to pumpkin pie, we're ready to simplify your holiday. Place your order from our holiday menu and spend your holiday the right way, relaxing. Our fresh prepared holiday meals to go are designed with your busy schedule in mind. Visit us at stewartsmarket.com or at 229 Elm Street, New Canaan. If you're watching this broadcast, you're not alone. The HAN Network is available for 200,000 Connecticut cable customers on the Frontier Network. And we've also reached 1.7 million viewers on our free live streaming sports, news, and entertainment broadcasts. To reach our rapidly growing audience, contact Advertising Director Jessica Murren at 203-273-7312 or email jessica at han.network. Welcome back to Yankee Fisherman, presented by The Dock Shop, Thursday, December 3rd. Coming up on the holidays, just a real quick note, no new shows the next two weeks, then we'll be back December 22nd. Thanks again to Bob Rooley for spending some time with us. Good luck with the new gig at the American Museum of Fly Fishing. Stop in and say hi if you're in Manchester for Hooked on the Holidays this Saturday, December 3rd. And we'll be up there and we'll be doing a lot more with the American Museum of Fly Fishing. Another piece of fly fishing history is being spun in a new way. And it's by a Connecticut company. When I was up at Arts of the Angler, presented by the Catskill Fly Fishing Center and Museum up at the Ethan Allen Inn in Danbury, uh, early, no late, early November, I met Fred Balling. And Fred has a company, totally in Connecticut, that's putting a new spin on a very handsome and very effective old school reel design. Yankee Fishermen, we're at Art of the Angler, the Ethan Allen Inn in Danbury, presented by the Catskill Fly Fishing Center and Museum. Catching up with Fred Balling of the Perfection Fly Reel Company in West Cornwall, Connecticut. You got it. An old school design but it's small and it looks like it's been retooled with some modern techniques? That's exactly um, where we're at with that, is that I felt that if these guys could make reels as beautiful as this 100 years or 120 years ago with modern technology and machining, why couldn't we do the same thing? Why couldn't we make a good fly fishing reel that was dictated by its design rather than dictated by what the machine wanted it to look like. What attracted you to this design of reel? This really, it, before we had billets cut out of it, before the, the large arbor, where it's a really, you, really recognizable design for a fly reel. What attracted you to that? Uh, before I started making fly reels, I was an antique dealer. And as an antique dealer, I found myself drifting towards early fly fishing equipment because it was simply so much better design and manufacture than it had to be for the simple job it was expected to perform. So when I started fishing seriously, I automatically went to the vintage stuff. So it's sort of, I skipped a few generations when I started my fishing. And so uh, this, this, uh, this early type of handmade equipment with its uh, ratchet and pole and stuff like that just seemed so natural to me that I just went with it and when I couldn't find it anymore I started making it. Where do you have these made? I work very closely uh, with a machinist who has absolutely, in fact he hates fish, with a, mach <laughs> with a machinist in Winstead, Connecticut. Um, actually his hobby is snowmobiles but he has a, a great sense of flow and process and he truly understands this work even though he's not interested in fishing at all. One thing I like about this old school design is it does look like a, a one piece reel. Some of the newer things they do look like 
they're multi multi part. Mm -hmm. When this looks like a, one single unit working together within itself. Well, it's a, it's a coherent design, and to get the outside right, you have to get the inside right. Uh, there's only so much room to uh, to work in there. And if you get anything wrong, um, the machine, the machine, the reel that you're working on is just going to rise up and, and bite you anyway. So you really have to pay particular attention to the relationship of, of the parts as well as the, the final look. We spend a lot of time thinking about the sound of the click and things like that that you might not ordinarily be associated with if you're building five million fishing reels. I noticed earlier when I picked one of these up, some of these are pretty heavy. Yeah. How do they balance with a rod? Um, oh, probably over 50% of my own fishing is done with a bamboo rod. And I find that um, the weight of this, for instance, this particular reel is um, seven ounces. And uh, it very nicely balances against like an eight foot five weight bamboo rod. In fact, um, I feel, and my customers tell me as well, that the weight of this reel actually helps turn the rod over. And it's, so it's, it's an additional um, amount of inertia that goes in, into the cast. So uh, it, it always balances very nicely when you put it on a, on a, on a handle. Uh, you put the, the reel on there and it just you know balances right about here, which is about where you would expect it to be. Yeah, that's, that's perfect there. And those bamboo rods a little bit heavier than a lot of today's graphite, etc. They, I, uh, you could argue that the modern graphite rods are a lot lighter than they need to be. That may well be the case. I wouldn't debate that <laughs> because it's it's not only about weight; it's about balance. Do you think? A little bit of weight can add a little bit to the rod. Like I have always liked that a little bit heavier because you've got to punch it that much harder. Oh, I agree entirely. And or um, it also it just makes you kind of respect the fact that you're fishing with wind. You know, there there are, there are things that you're you're. I think when you fish a, a bamboo rod, you're more aware of, of your surroundings because, first of all, you don't want to crash the rod against a tree or something either. No, <laughs> so, that never ends well. <laughs> so, the, I, um, I don't know, I think about 10% of um, fly fishermen today uh, use bamboo to a certain extent, so it's not totally a lost art. I think we're seeing a renaissance of it. I think so. There are certainly more people making bamboo rods today than there were a hundred years ago. And every one of them that you talk to is backed up at least two years on those. That's true. That's true. And there's, you know, by my count, at least when I started making reels, I pretended to count about a thousand people in North America who have real uh, rods in the field that have their name on them. Someone's actually bought them. You're also making some really handsome, very old school looking cases for these reels. Those just as important with the antique model as the reel. If you can have the reel in the case and they match and they're intact and they've been together for life, it really makes a difference in there. You've got some really handsome yet rustic and crafted looking leather cases with these reels. I only wish I could make them myself. It's, it's very hard to, to motivate a, uh, a leather craftsman to to make one of these. Um, they're, you know, these are all sewn by hand. They take a good number of hours. That my cost is usually about $150 on them. But you get someone who'll make you a few, and he suddenly says, "No, I don't want to make any more. They're too labor-intensive." And you go, "Well, 
I can pay you for your labor, for your time. And they say, you know, I'm an artisan. I'm not a manufacturer. You know, I'll make as many as I can, but don't expect me to supply you for a long time. So there, I'm always in, I'm always searching for a good good leather craftsman to to help me with my cases. What are some of the names of the models of the Perfection fly reels? Well, this one um, is the first first one I made when I struck out on my own uh, without any partners. It's called the Fairy Reel, and it's based on a, an old model of the H.L. Leonard reel made for the uh, Mills Company of New York. Uh, so this is the Fairy. Uh, this one is probably a little shiny for me here, but this is um, based on a reel made by a watchmaker around 1900. His name is uh, Benjamin Meek. And um, his reels were one size smaller than this. So rather than calling this just simply the Meek reel, um, we call it, because his was the 44, we call it the 44 Special, which suggests, you know, a, an uptick in size. Uh, this one just happens to be one of a kind, but it's that fairy wheel, and I've made it uh, almost twice as wide as the initial fairy, so this might handle a uh, three or four weight line, whereas the earliest fairy would be a two and three weight. So this is, this is uh, as uh, traditional as it looks, it's kind of an innovative reel in that sense. These can withstand a modern design fly uh, line? Oh yeah, uh, I, I prefer using um, silk or even um, modern synthetic silk lines, uh, only because it, it feels right, but uh, on some of them, it's, it's uh, beneficial to actually cut a line in half and just put half the line on the spool and uh, fill the rest of it with backing so that near the end of the line you don't get all this like spaghetti windings when you cast. What are the price ranges on the Perfection Fly Reel? They, um, they, they range, they currently range from $1,250 to $1,900. Uh, I put a great deal of research and design time in them, and so that price reflects that. However, I've uh, come to think that maybe uh, I could take advantage of some of this uh, time spent and come up with uh, a more efficiently built reel. Uh, these are obviously just uh, parts, prototypes, but I'm trying to make a reel that reflects that tradition and still maintain the quality and character of the Perfection Fly Reel brand. Um, by making a real and larger quantity for less money. So I'm not exactly selling out, but I'd like to sell out this edition of reels. And those look to be a different material than the ones that we just looked at. It's a good observation. This is, this is actually a, a custom-made hard rubber material uh, made in small quantities for me uh, by a custom outfit in Trenton, New Jersey. Uh, and this is, this is a modern um, space age material called Delrin, and it may not have the same depth and luster, but uh, it's much easier to work with, and it's not expensive, and if you make a mistake, you just throw it away and start again. This is uh, ordinary aluminum, but unlike modern aluminum reels, it's not anodized. It's simply been uh, run through, run in a tumbler for eight to ten hours just to give it that kind of antique look. I guess you could call it shot painting, but it's, it's raw aluminum, which I hope will age over time. Where can one find Perfection Fly Reels? You can contact me at perfectionflyreel.com. Fred Bowling, thank you very much for uh, explaining these very handsome Connecticut-made fly reels. Here on Yankee Fisherman, we'll be back with more right after this.
The holidays are a wonderful time to spend with families and friends, sharing a fantastic meal, football season is in full swing, the fishing has been unbelievable, and it's time to make a list and check it twice. Stop at the dock shop, get a fix of summer, and browse loads of new products, including fishing tackle, accessories, clothing, jewelry, and home decor. Boater, beach bum, fisherman, or simply love the New England coast, this is a unique place to shop. The dock shop. 51 Tokenik Road, Darien, 609 Riverside Avenue, Westport, or DocShop.com. At Hoyt Livery, our goal is to always... Sam, what are you doing? We're filming a commercial. I'm checking out the new Hoyt On The Go app. Hoyt's, Hoyt's here. here! One, two, three, happy! You know! I want to find out how good I am! Yes, sir! You relax, you get blown up. Let's get it done! Let's get it done! What can you take advantage of right now? Yeah, come on. I can push myself way beyond what you think. Special technique. Bring it back. Have a sports injury or slip and fall that needs immediate care? Coastal Ortho Express Urgent Care gives you direct access to an orthopedic specialist fast, without an appointment. Basketball, hockey, skiing, whatever the sports injury is, sprain or fracture, Coastal Ortho Express can help. Coastal Ortho Express Urgent Care, open Monday through Saturday, now in two locations. The iPark Building at 761 Main Avenue in Norwalk and 36 Old Kings Highway South in Darien. Or go to CoastalOrthoExpress.com, like them on Facebook. What makes Darien special during the holiday season? Locally owned shops and restaurants where you can find everything you need to make your holidays more enjoyable. Start with breakfast, then shop for everything from toys to unique gifts and the latest trends in fashion. Take a coffee break, stop at our farmer's market or one of our shops where you'll find an amazing selection of cheeses and meats. Then enjoy dining at one of our fabulous restaurants. This holiday season, experience shopping and dining in Darien. Give your day a jump start with the latest news, sports, weather, and more on Coffee Break, live on the HAN Network, weekdays at 11 a.m. Connecticut news doesn't get any more local than on Coffee Break. I'm Frank Granito. And I'm Donald Ng for the HAN Network. Tune in to Nutmeg Sports Monday through Thursday, where we bring you all the top stories from Connecticut sports. From highlights to player interviews and expert analysis, no one gets you closer to Connecticut's games than Nutmeg Sports. Nutmeg Sports, now Monday through Thursday at 2 p.m. on the HAN Network. Welcome back to Yankee Fisherman, presented by The Dock Shop this Thursday, December 3rd. Thanks again to Fred Balling of the Perfection Reel Company. Great stuff there. I'd really uh, like to see how those reels are put together. Very handsome, very sturdy, very reminiscent of some of the classic old designs like the Von Amps, which command so much money at auction. Some events coming up, particularly holiday parties. A uh, little bit of work getting done this weekend. Nutmeg TU is doing a cleanup of the Mill River along Congress Street in Fairfield, not far from the eastern border. That is going to be right off the Merritt Parkway behind the service area on the southbound Merritt uh, by the old GE headquarters, the other side of the Merritt from that. Saturday, 9 a.m., volunteers are needed. If you can help out for a few hours, that's again at 9 Saturday on Congress Street in Fairfield. Mianus TU is having its holiday party December 13th. That's at the New Canaan Nature Center. Very, very timely speaker who's going to talk about fishing and traveling in Cuba. More information on that at myanistu.org. Uh, Candlewood Valley TU on December 14th at 7. They're going to talk about Vermont trophy trout streams with Connecticut angler John Springer. That's at the Stony Hill Fire Department on Stony Hill Road in Bethel. Doors open at 7. More information there at cvtu.org. Farmington Valley TU has its holiday party on December 15th at the Farmington Community Center in Unionville, and they're going to get the results of some sampling 
done by the DEEP. That should be an interesting one. I want to see those results. Information on that at fvtu.org. And Nutmeg TU is going to do an event kind of reminiscent of the television show Chopped on December 20th at its holiday party. It's open to fly tires. You can come in. There are going to be three rounds. You're going to be given ingredients and a, a fly that you have to tie. They'll judge the finished products after 10 minutes. One person will be eliminated after each round. Winner's going to get a $25 gift card and some other prizes. There'll also be a potluck and expanded raffles. Holiday party, usually a good time. That's at Port 5 in Bridgeport. More information at nutmegtrout.org. That's going to do it for this issue of Yankee Fisherman. We will be back before the holidays to talk about all things fishing and maybe some gift ideas. Till then, tight lines.